the first thing that matters to me is human relationships. That is more important to me than the truth. I know this sounds quite outrageous, but in this regard, I'm rather like Boris Johnson. I'm interested in an outcome. I'm more than I'm interested in um, uh, knowledge. And the outcome I'm interested in, first and foremost, and I think this has been true all my life actually, is an enriched peace between people who are different. This has been my obsession. I was brought up, you know, by communists at the beginning of the Cold War. And uh, so it's not surprising in a way. Unlike an awful lot of the left, it seems to me, I'm not obsessed with the truth, with having it, with saying it, with spelling it out. Because my first point of interest is in the relationship. Who is the speaker and who are they speaking to? What kind of relationship do they have? And then what can happen between them that will make for something better and richer and more complex rather than something which imposes the one person's you know, apparent interest on the other in a way that often leads to violence. From the very foundation of Open Democracy 20 years ago, Rosemary Batchelor has been at the heart of the organisation, commissioning, editing, writing herself and helping the rest of the team to think through what we do and to better understand the world. In the last year, she became increasingly sick with a terminal lung condition, and that made it hard for her to have long conversations. But this summer, I recorded a series of quite brief conversations with her in, in which she explored her ideas further and gave some commentary on the state of the world and the state of politics as it is. What follows is a kind of edited collection of snippets from those conversations. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Rosemary emailed me very keen to have one last discussion to clarify her thoughts on some of the themes that we unearthed in this chat. But I'm afraid that sadly Rosemary died this weekend before we could have that final chat. So what follows is highlights from the conversations that Rosemary and Anthony Barnett and I did have together this summer. I'll always be sad that we never managed to have that final conversation, but please do enjoy what we've got. Thank you. You, you can't just stand by the dispossessed, the underinformed and the underprivileged. If you're going to educate them, actually, you have to engage with them and you have to be able to persuade them to change their minds. Now, this is a difficult thing to say. It's a difficult thing to say about young black people who are fed up to the back teeth with white people telling them what to do. It's a difficult thing to say about men who've had it up to here with feminists telling them what's wrong with the, with the way that they behave. But the fact is that for me, politics is mainly not about uh, castigating the powerful, what they do and what they, what interests they have. They do what they have to do. It's in their interest. It's pretty damn straightforward. And I have to say, we have a bunch of blighters ruling the world at the moment who are totally brazen about it. It's not as if they hide what they're up to at all. Um, what is much more difficult to work out is in this area of populist politics, um, uh, where I am particularly interested in notions of nationalism. And um, here I should say that the notion of nationalism I'm particularly interested in is a very reduced nationalism. Um, it's nothing to do with the complex um, imagined communities. It, it really isn't about cultural inheritance. It is quite literally about taking your own ego, your humiliated, defeated ego, and giving it, you know, 100 times, 10,000 times the amount of power that you think you have, because you identify yourself as working on behalf of the nation. I think that you're timid about that for very obvious reasons, that, you know, why should somebody come along from some public school and tell me what to think? Uh, <clears throat> why shouldn't I just support them? Because they, they merit support. And you see, I, I don't think one can. Pedagogy is very important. And the left needs to have active prog programs of political education. And I think the way you do that is through conversation. Um, you know, and, and that you, you know... But you, you also have to do it through empowerment. 
and, that's the point. And organising. You know, I, I think that the way the way to educate people is <coughs> is to is conversation and organising. But also conversing with them in a way which says you're wrong about this and you're right about that, and allows them to fight back, and yeah. allows them to tell you that you're talking a load of rubbish. We have to just recognise that people are in the middle of a maelstrom of conflicting stories. And if we're going to get an advantage in that maelstrom, we have to take people who've struggled their way through a hell of a lot of rubbish, and we've got to start talking to them as equals, but telling them that it's rubbish. And, and, and sometimes we'll commit some, if we're lucky. That's going to be extremely uphill work. But you don't get anywhere by giving people the truth on a plate, because they will never thank you for it. They won't even recognise it in the first place. That space, that power, is power that's going on in the land. That indeed, what it offers people is this greatness, this magnified, exacerbated sense of identifying with the nation that makes people feel that they are strong and that they're great. And we want to puncture that, actually. We want to say, you're not strong and great. You're having a dreadful time. You're not capable of anything. You can't protect anyone you love. You'll never get anything you want. But we want you to join us because we'll make you happier in the end. And it's not an easy ask, but we, that is our truth, in fact. And there's no real getting away from it. Sorry, can, can you say that again, Rosemary? So the truth okay. is, we, you offer people, you, uh, uh, you, you're, you both say to people the bleak fact that they're powerless, they're screwed, et cetera, et cetera but also that there's a chance to be stroppy, to fight back? Yes, and also you offer them an experience of empowerment. This is why that's crucial, because real empowerment, when you're working in a team with people who have different reasons for working with you, but are nevertheless working together, and you achieve something together, that is a totally different feeling from this fantasy identification with the strong man and the national us, which goes on in football games and dissipates the minute you get home, just before you beat up your wife. As I said to you right at the beginning of this interview, I'm more interested in powers of persuasion and processes of persuasion. And frankly, they don't have an awful lot to do with this obsession with the high ground, the moral high ground and truth. But you do think there are things you can say that are true? Oh, of course. And, and I think that um, everything I say is aimed at an ultimate truth of right. course it's just i think that the class struggle as i said is absolutely buried miles thick in ideology and if we want to get at the truth we have to understand the ideologies how they work how they impact on people what we're taking away from them if we try and criticize it and what it takes to give them something back that will be a better option for them that they will see as such. I think this woke campaign business that the government has launched now with a lot of friendly people around it is very carefully calculated to bring out the very worst in the left. And I think they're doing quite well. And that's partly because of the identity politics syndrome, which is very difficult to extrapolate from the neoliberal syndrome <clears throat> that Adam was mentioning which is the one that accuses individuals of being entirely responsible for everything in their lives. Yeah. What I'd say is two things. The first is, of course, it is absolutely the case that the hegemonic ideology of the age, which has been neoliberalism, neoliberalism is now dying, but it has been, shapes the manner and style of resistance to it. And so absolutely, it could be infuriating to see the way that particularly people who um, perhaps haven't been politically educated enormously, haven't been involved in political struggle for a very long time, often individualised blame. Um, on the other hand, you know, the, the, I, I often struggle with people's use of the term identity politics, because what they usually mean by that phrase is any kind of anti-racist or anti-sexist politics that they personally don't like. And it's, you know, come to have a whole range of meanings. When in reality, 
what we're seeing is, on the one hand, a significant advance in movements against racism and against sexism. And on the other hand, a significant backlash against those. And, you know, the, the attempt to label those movements as, you know, woke or social justice warriors or whatever you want to call them is an inevitable consequence of their success. And of course, the right will continue to do that. And the appropriate response to that is not to continue, is not to join them in deriding identity politics. It's to articulate as best you can and along with people, you know, who you think are doing it well. And as a platform to give platform to, you give space to people who do it well, a better version of, a more radical version of anti-racist, anti-sexist, et cetera, politics, liberation politics, which does seek to challenge power, does seek to challenge power structures. You know, the, you know, the term woke was invented by working class black people in America saying that they ought to, edu- you know, you need to educate yourself, you need to become awake um, to the complex injustices of the world. And the fact that in the last couple of years, the right has, tr- has you know, tried to label this as some kind of, you know, individualization of blame, when it's always about the opposite, um, is in itself a deep injustice. And I think we really, really shouldn't be participating in that. We should be struggling against it. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I agree with that. And I <clears throat> personally can't think of either anti-racist or anti-sexist approaches, as I don't like. Um, but I don't like the identity politics element of it, because well, it belongs well, by that. Well, well, how, Sorry, how you I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. I mean a very basic neoliberal premise that what you have to do in life is make yourself, and that you can make yourself, and that you can make yourself according to any image, as long as you're um, committed enough to to get on with it. And um, I'm, I'm talking about all the do-it-yourself books. I'm talking about vast industries of consumerism and choice. Your choice is you. What you eat is you. The perfume you wear, the kind of, um, the kind of, uh, well, everything is you. Um, this is a vast conspiracy against collectivity and against community, and against altruism, and against revolution. And I'm against that. Of course, I'm against all those things too. You know, I I hate the way that, um, you know, if neoliberalism was a phase of capitalism, the highest phase of capitalism after imperialism, was about kind of driving markets back into Western states and back into new public sectors and so on of the original imperial countries, the colonizing powers. Then what we're seeing now is this sort of driving of the market into people's souls. And, um, you know, absolutely, we need to oppose that. But the right is trying to, you know, that, that process of driving your liberalism into your soul has been spun by the right as kind of aligning with and being done by anti-racist movements, by feminist movements, etc. when in reality it's being done by the right and by the market. And I think every time we accept that kind of attempt to glue those things together by you know creating labels like identity politics, like wokeness, etc., rather than separating those things out and saying no. We absolutely stand against the structural oppressions of racism and sexism and homophobia, while also opposing the marketization of our lives. Every time we fail to do that, when we kind of accept that discourse, that narrative of the right, we're doing their job for them. And you know that's why I am in favour of wokeness. I'm in favour of um, identity politics. I'm in favour of all those things because they are those terms are used as a way to elide people's experience of having the market driven into their lives with something that's happened at the same time, which is a new wave of movements against racism and sexism and homophobia. And they're not the same thing. The activists in those movements tend to be pretty sophisticated in understanding that what they're organizing against is structural power rather than some tendency within individuals. And it's usually the right and the right-wing media which you know, locate the problem 
of racism in individuals, the problem of sexism in individuals, rather than in society and social structures. And that it's not, you know, that <clears throat> why on earth would we accept that understanding that they quite cleverly glued together? You know, the people who are doing this, two people who are driving the market into our souls, are at the same time trying to blame what they're doing on progressives. And, you know, what we should do in response to that is stand up to it, not accept it. I suppose what worries me is that I think, all right, often the leaders of these movements are pretty sophisticated about all this stuff, because by dint of being leaders, they tend to have an overview on their movement and on its historic trajectory. But if you ask about what motivates people to join a movement, what makes people active rather than unactive, then you're in the area of social recognition very often. This move from the left-wing preoccupation with redistribution, broadly speaking, to an obsession about social recognition. Uh, for me, I mean, that I first noticed this when Labour got into power, new Labour that is, and they suddenly announced that their children should be able to go to Oxbridge. I don't know if you remember that stage, but they declared war really on um, the exclusivity of the upper middle class in education, public schools, and particularly universities. But you could see that underneath it all was, why shouldn't my sons and daughters be able to have um, champagne on the lawn and May balls and all the rest of it? And that gets you into a very murky area of contestation, I think. I don't think it's very uh, helpful. I don't think social mobility is a Marxist category. And yet it is absolutely the driver, as Michael Sandel and all these wonderful liberals point out, to all the preoccupations that so many millions of ordinary people have. You know, he says there's a terrible dividing line between those who get a further education in the States and those who don't get it. Much more important, he's implying, in the class. But that's a question of status and social recognition. And there is this obsession, I think, with, I want to show you that I have every right to be recognized in society just like you do. Now, do you get beyond that to the point where you want to side with all the oppressed and chuck the oppressors and get a new kind of system? That's a different move. It's got to be motivated in a different way. For the left to borrow nationalism in order to fight far-right nationalism is a total mistake because what you're doing is copying the same structure. You want your strong man to be Mélenchon and you want the us to be some brought together grouping where you can never quite explain how diverse groups are brought together for us. But you, you, you think it's a much better process, of course, than the right to have. Um, but you can't quite describe it. But it's really dangerous because it ends up in the right, in the same place, left nationalism, as right nationalism, in that it is a fantasy of grandeur and effectivity which doesn't really exist. And I wanted to say what the left have to offer is that if they can show people how empowerment really works, if they can show that when you bring people together, working together, in all their diversity, then something extraordinary begins to get done very often. Um, then we'll show that we have a more pleasurable option of empowerment and that it's real. And both those things are important. The reality of the empowerment, that it actually does get something done, and that it is pleasurable and that it's diverse. Those are its qualities. And I just wanted to say we'd win by dint of the fact that theirs is fantasy and ours is real. But of course I was doing that terrible mistake for anybody who, who flirts with Marxist thinking, that you become a philosopher, which I think is fatal. It's fatal once you get into this binary real and false. I'm very serious about how we move on from that stage where cancel culture or whatever it is, you know, says no. I genuinely want to know what you do the day after you've gone through that and, and got the this, this sort of self-confidence that you need. I suppose I, my difficulty with that is that I think you're asking a question with a false premise. You know, there is no such thing as counterculture. That is a fiction of the right. 
There's no book or film that's been cancelled. There's no, no person who's been There's speakers, speakers being cancelled at universities. Very, very few. And, you know, speakers don't have rights to speak at universities. Um, the actual <laughs> list of speakers who've been cancelled at universities is, is minimal. I want to support Adam on this one because I think that uh, they're looking, the right, it seems to me very clear, is looking for a replacement of the war on terror. Um, and the war on terror, you know, well, that's failed. He's, you know, it didn't work. Uh, and they're going to mobilize now for a war on China, Cold War on China. Because of 9-11, they had a very good reason to go on about terror, uh, but they were using it for uh, d domestic mobilization. And I think that the the, the right-wing think tanks, etc., cetera, and, uh, are, are picking up woke because, you know, they haven't got the war on terror and they're looking for a way of beating everybody up and, and yes. uh, disciplining people. Yep. Um, and, I, and, you know, I think this is perfectly true. But, I mean, they are the fucking cancellers. They've always been the cancellers. Their whole operation is about cancelling. So I, I think the cancel culture stuff is, is completely, completely contrived. The new generation, Adam's generation, if you like, and younger, are very sensitive to disrespect. And I think this is a humanization. I think this is entirely positive. But uh, when you are sensitive to disrespect, you say, oh my God, you want me to read Ovid, uh, and there are all these women being raped. Well, you know, I'm not sure about this. Now, the argument not reading of it because it's about things that are terribly unpleasant is or what happens to women in of it is obviously that is cancel culture if you like it's very bad but the argument that you have to be sensitive to this that you don't read of it saying ho 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 look here's a rape scene and all that you don't use it to reinforce uh uh, uh misogyny which is all too easy to do I think all that's incredibly positive. Cancel culture, of course, has been vilified by the right. And, and OK, you can say it's a myth, it didn't really exist, but some of it existed. And it is more indicative of a much broader phenomenon, which I began to talk about in previous sessions as this obsession with the truth, as opposed to persuasion. If you remember, that's how I started. And for me, that's what has happened to create a lot of left-wing factionalism is that people want to have the truth they want to be of the truth they want to be of the party of the truth they want to have friends who have the truth and this becomes a certain kind of identity politics it seems to me you're moving from this world that we said was interested in redistribution of goods and wealth and power to this modern world we're in now where recognition is the key. Actually, the only thing to do in this world, if you want to change it, is to start persuading other people who don't yet realise that they want change. We spoke about um, what you call identity politics and um, capitalism. And I suppose the way I see a lot of this is that, you know, surveillance capitalism, which kind of comes after neoliberalism chronologically, has driven the market into people's souls and worked very hard at telling people who we are. You, know, you are this person and we will advertise this at you on Facebook or YouTube or whatever it is. And we need you to sit in a spreadsheet, you know, as this particular, in this particular place. And it's entirely predictable that the most natural form of resistance to that is people saying, no, I'm not. I'm not that kind of person, I'm this kind of person. And, you know, that produces a politics of what you would describe as identity or the individual identity. And on the one hand, I suppose, I get very concerned when I see people on the left criticizing that politics because that is people's kind of natural response to their experience of modern capitalism. Well, that's interesting that you, um link it more to surveillance capitalism and depict it as a reaction to the identity that's being pinned on one. 
Um, but I'd like to go back to the neoliberal aspect. So I think there's a more important aspect that you're neglecting, which is the way neoliberalism makes individuals responsible for their own destinies. And I think that the guilt involved, particularly for men, for example, in not being able to fulfill their ideal of what they should be as men, um, when they take it onto their own shoulders, the fact that they can't get jobs or they can't support their loved ones or they don't have loved ones or they, um, whatever it is, whatever the hell it is, or they can't get to the football match. I mean, hasn't football been fascinating over the last few weeks as we crawl back to people being able to go to matches? Doesn't it worry you the extent to which people are utterly dependent on these matches and their teams and their teams winning for the meaning in their lives? It really worries me. I can't understand how any society can sustain itself for long with that fragile a reward for being alive. I just can't. So these are the things that fascinate me. And when I hear people say to me, um, you know, uh, for example, I've got quite a lot of old, oldish left-wing friends who are now beginning to gather together after decades of being blown apart by the demise of the socialist countries, socialism and all the rest of it. I pointed out to them that one of our number from those days uh, had actually decided to join UKIP recently, I'd heard, and was wondering what his erstwhile comrades would have made of his move to join UKIP. And uh, you got the same reaction was, how the hell could you join UKIP? You may as well join join the National Front in France. If you're going to do that, how can you do that? And I felt that the question was more of an identity question than a political question. They weren't asking themselves, why had this comrade decided to go into UKIP because it's a movement bomb full of many ordinary people who uh, nevertheless have been seduced by bloody awful arguments. And he thought that he ought to be in there trying to uh, get them thinking in different ways. Um, they weren't thinking about that at all. They were thinking, do you really want to be associated with a Farage? You know, what would my friends say on my Facebook page? How many likes would I get or not likes would I get if I announced that I suddenly become a member of UKIP? Ugh. <laughs> now, maybe I'm maligning them. Maybe this was, uh, this is not their thinking. But I have to tell you that this is something I feel I meet a great deal that we've all shifted over in ways that we don't even perceive to thinking more about what does that say about us? What does it say about who we really are? Then we actually think tactically and strategically about how we're going to change things because you can only change things if there are some wonderful people who do join UKIP and start changing minds or get people out of UKIP and start changing their minds. Or, or, you know, if you can't do something about the 70 million people who voted Trump, you can't do anything about the United States. I think you're making a whole load of different arguments there. Um, some of them I very strongly agree with. So in about sort of 2008, 2009, um, a, a group of my friends and I became very, very frustrated with portions of the environmental movement that were focusing on individual change, um, change your light bulb, et cetera. Um, and the way that the government pushed this message, you know, that you need to change your light bulbs, you need to, you know, stop running the tap when you're brushing your teeth and so on, while failing to deliver systemic change. That far, I agree with you. you know, the, it's absolutely the case that often there's more of an, an interest in moral purity than there is in saving the planet and delivering uh, an egalitarian future, a democratic future. And I share that frustration, you know, and I agree that that is a product of neoliberalism. What I find frustrating about the way this conversation then goes is that I feel like you know, when you use the term identity politics to describe that process, 
because of the way other people use that term, you elide that process, the kind of individualization of blame and the neoliberalization and marketization of social change with the expansion of various liberation movements, of feminism, of LGBT movements, of movements for racial justice, and an increased kind of prevalence of people talking about, you know, their pride in being um, LGBT or black or women or whatever it is, which are often smeared as identity politics. And I think that there's a real risk in allowing those two things, the marketization of social change, the individualization of blame, and the um, you know, increased expression of people from previously marginalized groups um, of their identities as a way of resisting various structures of power which is, have historically oppressed them. And that the term identity politics is used to align those things and we need to separate them out. I agree with you things need separating out, but I separate them out in a different place because I do have an anxiety about the history of feminism, the history of, um, of um, the fight for racial equality and the, the history of the fight on, on gender and uh, gender and sexuality and all that. I do feel that neoliberalism has bought into um, selling a certain kind of um, um, concern with racism and gender of the kind that the BBC will take up, for example. I mean, big companies are taking that up. All sorts of big companies are taking it into their policy making. They've actually been persuaded over the years by people who've done an enormous amount of research and discovered, you know, something we knew in the first place, which is diversity is bloody good for your profit margin, for God's sake. I mean, so now they're telling themselves that and, and they're going with that stuff. Um, I think that the argument that's gone on on, on uh, trans people is one of the most unproductive dead ends that I've ever come across on the left. People who think that they can only defend their own feminist positions if they attack trans people. I, I don't understand how that happens. I, I actually think it's, it's held a lot of things back. The other thing I should make absolutely clear is that I actually think Black Lives Matter is a front line for class struggle in our world today. It's a tremendous success. And they realize that they're up against something that if pursued, if pursued to its full, wonderful, rich, diverse ends, could make, well, could challenge the system in itself. Uh, they know that that's what Black Lives Matter is. They know that that's what the movement is that responded to the killing of Sarah Everard. In my opinion, that has as much power to fundamentally change things. If people really looked into the role that misogyny plays in our societies today. So I think we need to talk a lot about race and gender and what it looks like if you take it away from the sort of neoliberal version. You need allies. And to do that, you need to be able to persuade people. And this is really what I've been talking about all the way through. The only way progressives are going to have a chance to stop the the many different forms of terrible destruction which await this planet is if we can start persuading many, many more constituencies that they have this in common. The common goal that you have is written by the history with which you come together. And yes, by definition, we can't possibly know what that is. But one thing we really do have to do is to have a bit more respect that other people will have a similar motivation for passionate desire for change as we do. The, the precondition for being progressive today is that you believe in the capacity of people to be, you know, as Philip Pullman said, we're better than they tell us we are. And they have told us for centuries now 
but we're grounded in Hobbesian sin um, and all those other miserablest people, that we're Darwinists and that we're this and that we're that. And actually, we see in pandemics that people are amazing. People do go out and help people. They reinvent communities. They somehow do find something really important to live for. And so if one just opens one's mind to the possibility of all the different people that might support all the different struggles and takes an interest in them and thinks about how to bring them together so that they realize that they've got one thing that they could go for. That's, that's, that's the wonderful gift of being on the left, that you love people and that you love pleasure and that you love, you love political success, but political success is precisely the liberation of people into self-organizing, into discovering what their thing is, <laughs> what they want, what their skills are, what they can do.